Hello, and welcome to the Water Research Foundation's webcast for California's In Conduit Hydropower Implementation Guidebook, a compendium of resources, best practices, and tools. My name is Ashwin Danasekar. I am a research manager at the Water Research Foundation, and I will be kicking off this webcast. I would like to run through a couple of housekeeping items before we get to introducing our presenters. You can submit questions through the question box at any time throughout this webcast. It is located to the left of your screen. We will hold a Q&A session at the end of the webcast. You can also download the slides under Event Resources. This is also located on the left side of your screen. Be sure to answer the three survey questions that pop up after the webcast. This helps us to hear your voice and continue to improve our webcast for the future. Lastly, the slides and recording will be available after the webcast on our website, www.waterrf.org, under Webcast on Demand. Now I would like to introduce the principal investigator on this project, Dr. Carla Churchy, who will briefly outline the project and introduce the rest of the presenters. Dr. Carla Churchy currently serves as a senior environmental engineer at Stantec and has over 10 years of experience in applied research that lies at the interface of several disciplines including water and wastewater quality, along with treatment, energy management, and sustainability. Dr. Churchy is leading a number of research projects awarded by nationally recognized organizations. Dr. Churchy is also the PI on WRF 4718, focused on battery energy storage systems and how it's being implemented at water utilities, addressing the challenges and providing guidance to utilize them to their full potential. With that, I'll pass it on to Dr. Churchy to outline the webcast and introduce the rest of the speakers. Take it away, Carla. Thank you, Ashwin, for the introduction. Uh, today, I have the honor to co-present this work with uh, several speakers, experts on uh, income with hydropower and renewable energy issues. First, I would like to start with uh, Dr. Silvia Palmarogas, uh, which serves as an electric generation system specialist at the California Energy Commission and has over 17 years of experience in applied research and development of renewable energy. Uh, Dr. Palma leads different renewable energy areas and uh, she managed the electric program investment charge EPRIC program solicitation for CEQ. Dr. Ayusari currently serves as an environmental engineer at Stantec uh, and has over five years of experience in various applied research projects that connect different water related disciplines uh, from water and wastewater treatment to asset management, emerging contaminants and nutrient management. Jean Goodenough is a co-founder and senior vice president of product and finance for Inline Energy, a renewable energy development company focused on small hydropower projects. Inline Energy is a small hydroelectric tube preferred provider for the Association of California Water Agencies. Oscar Ramos is the general superintendent at San Gabriel Valley Water Company since 2013. As part of his role, Oscar supervises the distribution and production department and is responsible for the design and maintenance of the water production uh, system. And Jim Montibo is a licensed civil engineer, graduated with a mechanical engineer degree from Cal Poly. Jean has been serving as a general manager of Mamador Water Agency since September 2009, where he was able to lead important renewable projects uh, to offset the agency's power requirements. So, and uh, uh, I will now turn it over to you, Sylvia, to briefly introduce the California Energy Commission research efforts. Thank you very much, Carla. Before going through my presentation, I would like to thank Stantec and Light Energy at Stanford University for the work done during this agreement. Also, to thank the Water Research Foundation for facilitating this webinar. This project with Stantec was funded in 2017 by our Electric Program Investment Charge, known as the EPIC Program. And for the same EPIC sol solicitation that awarded this project, the Energy Commission also funded three more agreements that supported the deployment of in conduit hydropower projects in California. The Energy Commission has several funding, let me just pass here, the yeah, the Energy Commission have several funding programs that support clean energy solutions from the electric, electricity sector. The CPUC, that is the California Public Utility Commission, established the EPIC program in 2011 to address a critical gap in California clean energy policy. So, since 2013, 
the EPIC program provides approximately 162 million annually to fund investments that will advance pre-commercial clean energy technologies and tools for the benefits of electricity with payers of California's three largest electric investor on utilities. The Energy Commission administered 80% of the EPIC funds, as you can see in this slide, that the annual budget is 133 million annually. Um, the, N the, N the Energy Commission EPIC funds invest in the area of applied research and development where the prototypes are designed and tested, the area of technology demonstration and deployment where the technology readiness goes to the pre-commercial levels, and the market facilitation to prepare companies and products to go to the market. If you would like to learn more ab about our EPIC program or identify our funding opportunities, I encourage you to go to our website and subscribe to our email listserv. Here you can find the link in Opportunities Email Listserv. Also, if you would like to learn more about our EPIC projects, you can go to the EPIC Innovation Showcase link and you can find all our projects. With this, I end my presentation. Looking forward to your comments and feedback, and I turn it over to Carla. Thank you. Thank you, Silvia. And uh, we would like to join you acknowledging all the individuals and agencies that supported this project in different ways. First, of course, uh, the California Energy Commission for funding this project. Then all the project team members from Suntech, Inline Energy, and the Renewable Center Stanford University, the members of the Technical Advisory Committee, uh, the technology providers, and all the utilities that provided information and lessons learned in their role as a case study. In terms of the agenda for this webinar, we first uh, wanted to provide some background on the project and talk about the drivers, the project objectives and research approach. Uh, we will then provide an overview of some of the life cycle aspects of in hydropower projects and we will hear the journey of two utilities in California that have successfully implemented this type of system. We'll then walk you through the business case assessment tool that was developed for the study. And uh, lastly, we'll present the findings of the in conduit hydropower resource assessment developed around the state of California. So in recent years, world utilities have started diversifying their energy portfolio with renewable energy options, mostly to face the challenges associated with a continuous energy price escalation to improve their energy reliability, but also to achieve more sustainable operations. So uh, small hydropower is now increasingly being considered as an important source of renewable energy by water utilities and water purveyors in general. According to a study that recently was conducted by the Oak Ridge National Lab, um, small hydropower in the last decade has contributed to about 5% of the total hydro generation nationally. And about 3,600 3, megawatts are generated through small hydropower as of the number uh, stated in 2017. In 2006, a study that was conducted by the California Energy Commission showed that Although the greatest potential for small hydropower in California lies in natural water, an additional substantial potential of 255 megawatts can be also extracted from man-made conduits. So for this project, we use the definition of in conduit hydropower as it was previously developed and uh, proposed by the study developed, developed by California Energy Commission in 2006 which defined in conduit hydropower as a uh, uh, unit process capable of generating up to 10 megawatt capacity in man-made infrastructure used to convey and supply municipal, industrial, or agricultural water. So currently, much of the embedded energy uh, potential in water supply and conveyance system, as we all know, is being wasted in energy dissipating devices such as uh, pressure reducing valves or in canal drop. So having the opportunity to harvest this energy can provide an additional means to uh, operate water delivery and conveyance system in a more cost-effective, sustainable, and efficient way. 
In conduit hydropower has recently received large attention from water purveyors, mostly due to the simplified regulatory framework and permitting process, both at the federal and state levels. Example of this is the Hydropower Regulatory Efficiency Act of 2013 that was released by, by FERC. And in addition to these regu regulatory changes, there has also been a recent uh, technological renaissance in the, of the shelf, more modular and water to wire turbines that have improved the efficiency and lowered the cost of ownership of the in-conduit hydropower installations, particularly those targeting the sub one megawatt market. The figure here on the slide shows the chronological evolution of several hydro turbine technologies from mid-1800 to the present, where new technologies are uh, being introduced and are now uh, in use. So these technological but also regulatory changes have provided uh, opportunities to revisit sites that were previously considered to be technically or financially unfeasible. Despite this advancement, it was observed that the actual development of projects has not reached the expected potential, particularly in the state of California. Few potential reasons for this low market penetration are listed in this slide. And uh, first of all, water agencies are often concerned about the potential impact of water flows availability, particularly in areas affected by drought conditions. Uh, there might be a limited knowledge on the newest technologies and on the various life cycle stages uh, related to in-conduit hydropower projects. Uh, there is some sort of complexity and uncertainties uh, of the regulatory landscape and some limited familiarity with the inter interconnection rules and interconnection issues. Some uncertainties are also relate, is also related to the tariff structure since their change can uh, really modify uh, and affect the business case of this, this type of project. And then also the lack of funding or incentives or the lack of organizational support that sometimes uh, becomes a barrier uh, for uh, uh, agencies that want to, to move this type of project uh, forward. So in view of these challenges, the California Energy Commission released the funding for this project with the objective of, first of all, de developing a guidebook that provides guidance and recommended practices on various life cycle aspects of an incongruent hydropower project. The second objective was to create a business case assessment tool that utilities can use to assess the feasibility of projects and related cost benefits. And finally, the goal was to develop a generation potential uh, assessment for the state of for the state of California, which could update the previous uh, CEC studies and the related figures that were estimated in 2006. So to meet the objective of this project, the research approach consisted of six different tasks. The first was to provide a comprehensive and critical literature review to gain a better understanding of um, uh, the in-conduit hydropower global practice. So as part of this task, we also developed and distributed a questionnaire to water and wastewater utilities and interviewed technology providers. We then conducted a series of case studies to better understand the drivers, the success factors, barriers, and challenges of in-conduit hydropower projects. We also facilitated a workshop of experts to discuss the challenges and issues around the defined project themes. And, and then the information that we could gather to this task were instrumental and critical for the development of the guidebook in task four and for the business case assessment tool development in task five. And lastly, as we mentioned earlier, the study developed a new statewide resource assessment of incondite hydropower using a novel data uh, driven methodological approach. So the next slide will focus on providing a brief overview of the key life cycle aspects related to in-conduit hydropower projects. Any project progress is really through three main stages, including the feasibility assessment, the design and construction phase, and then after commissioning the operation stage when uh, performance are monitored and uh, evaluated. So the slide that follow will uh, describe the main activities uh, pertaining to each of these uh, phases. But for now, uh, let me uh, just walk you through some of the aspects of a feasibility assessment for this type of in-conduit hydropower project, which 
generally includes the assessment of the site and the selection of the technology, the regulatory and permitting assessment, the evaluation of the interconnection process requirements, and also the assessment of the project financial uh, feasibility. In the first part of the project, the water utilities or the developer, the project developer for it, should consider uh, assessing the potential site for implementation of the in-conduit hydropower system. The figure here summarizes some potential areas where this embedded excess energy can be harvested. We are looking at location in distribution systems, uh, wastewater treatment plant outfall, irrigation areas, and, uh, but it's also important to note that uh, among the criteria that we have to use for the selection of the site, we should consider, for example, the availability of flows throughout the year, the proximity to the interconnection with, with the grid, the downstream process requirements, states, and other operational constraints that the utility might have. As a second step, we also need to identify the energy potential of the site of interest, which uh, um, is uh, kind of summarized in the formula that you, you see there on the screen, uh, which largely depends on the net stressed head, on the volumetric flow rate, and the overall system efficiency. It is important to note here and to mention that uh, uh, some of the newest technologies, such as some Archimedean hydrodynamic screw turbines, can also handle heads as low as uh, uh, three feet, so around one meter. Due to the time constraints for this presentation, we are not going to be able to go into the details of uh, the power generation by harnessing hydrokinetic energy of water flows. However, the report that will be published by the, water risk, by the uh, California Energy Commission will include some discussion on this newly introduced uh, hydrokinetic system as well. Despite the large variety of turbines, the conventional technology can be largely categorized as either reaction or impulse turbines. The first generally use both pressure and water movement to generate the upward force that rotates the runner blade, while the impulse type, such as the Pelton or uh, turbo turbines, uh, the runner rotates by the water jets uh, at high velocity. Although the conventional technologies are quite robust, several manufacturers are now offering novel turbine technologies for wider applications and sites that, has, that have not been considered in the past. We are uh, seeing, for example, hydro engine from natural energy uh, for low head system, more modular water wheels from uh, Ilias Atlas, and we are seeing uh, in-stream energy systems, for example, developing hydrokinetic turbines, in addition to inland francis, uh, siphon turbines, and so forth. So all these are, again, well described in the final report, um, and there, there was also a peer-reviewed publication that was published in the Journal of Environmental Management, which reviews uh, in that all these technologies. So I encourage you to, uh, to look for that uh, publication as well if you want more information. In general, uh, um, the practitioners are very confident in the performance of the conventional technology just because they have been proven for decades and they have uh, had a higher level of maturity than uh, emerging technologies. However, the newest technologies are offering the advantage of a more modular and compact design, opportunity for scalability, um, and uh, opportunity for reducing construction and uh, or operational costs. As I mentioned earlier, the selection really depends on uh, values and parameters such as uh, flows, head, and on uh, downstream pressure requirements. And it can be quite complex uh, since uh, there is a considerable overlap, as you can see from this figure, uh, showing the uh, um, selection of the turbine based on water discharges and, and head values. In general, reaction turbines are generally applicable to low head system, whereas impulse turbines for uh, medium to high head uh, application. Uh, as you can see from the figure, again, the lower head across a large range of flows can be covered by those emerging technologies such as uh, hydrodynamic screws, modular water seal, and uh, hydro engine. 
Moving on to the regulatory and permitting issues, uh, from a regulatory perspective, the federal government through FERC requires that utilities installing in conduit hydropower comply with the license, exception, or notice of intent, federal right of way, and environmental review. In general, in conduit hydropower projects are often considered to have minimal environmental impact, so most of the projects of less than 40 megawatts are eligible for conduit exemption from licensing by FERC. FERC also requires no license or exemption for qualifying facilities that comply with the criteria reported on the right side of the slide, such as, for example, for an installed capacity of less than 5 megawatts and for facilities, facilities that uh, not licensed or exempted before uh, August 2013. In addition to federal regulation, utilities must also comply with state uh, rules. Uh, some um, states developed uh, with them, including, for example, California. And in California, particularly, uh, this type of project need to undergo environmental reviews according to CEQA, unless, uh, of course, considered exempted as of uh, for in conduit projects of less than 5 megawatts. The rules and regulations pertaining to the interconnection process uh, again by, by state and the requirements are very uh, specific to the project. Uh, by interconnecting to the grid in California, for example, projects larger than one megawatt must comply with Kaizo new resource implementation, full network model, and also metering requirements. And some electric utilities also require the Kaizo metering installation for projects that are larger of uh, 55 kilowatts. So since turbines are also rotating equipment, no inverter, providing reactive power to the grid, the California Rule 2001 requires the installation of additional protective equipment. In general, the cost of interconnection varies, and uh, uh, based on the analysis of the case studies that uh, we developed for this project can also uh, achieve up to $250,000 uh, um, uh, as, as an interconnection value. So in general, one of the lessons learned from this study was to uh, really involve the electric utility very early on in the process uh, and try to maintain the communication between the electric utility and the water utility and the developer throughout the different stages of, uh, of the project. So now I will uh, uh, like to hand it over to Eugene to discuss some of the details related to the project's financial viability. Thank you, Carla. So as we talked a little bit about, when we evaluate a project's financial viability, we're really, there's a number of different financial metrics that one can look at. We've really honed in on two specific metrics that uh, many of our clients find most important. Uh, that tends to be payback. And we typically find that if a project is in the 15 to 20 year payback period, they'll move forward in terms of financial viability. And the other we look at is the um, net earnings or over the lifetime of the asset. And we typically model out a 30 to 50 year time period depend on the technology used. Now these technology assets have a useful asset life ranging from 30 to 100 years, depending on whether it's a pumpus turbine, which is near that lower end of the range, or something like a more traditional Pelton style turbine, which is near the higher end of that range. But we have found that we typically model in a 30 to 50 year range, as that's um, a fairly conservative estimate of the financial viability of the, of the project. And when looking at the financial viability, we really break it into two components, the cost component and the revenue component. When evaluating the cost component of a project, you really need to make sure you're looking at your capital costs as well as your ongoing O&M for the lifetime of the asset. Uh, capital costs, when we look at it, include everything from the turbine and infrastructure costs of the project, as well as environmental permitting and a lot of those non-construction costs that you need to make sure that you're looking at when evaluating a project, as well as the O&M of the project. And when looking at the operations and maintenance of, of the project, you really need to build up a reserve fund over time as the project gets older and degradates, so you can do things uh, which are larger cost components of that maintenance. From the revenue perspective side of the project, you really look at how you're going to monetize the power of that project. And what you're seeing on this slide is, in California, there's a number of ways you can monetize that power of a particular project. So how you're going to monetize the energy generated from the turbine. 
Um, while there's a number of different um, tariffs on here and opportunities to monetize uh, the power, if you look at the top, it's from left to right, it's whether you're monetizing behind the meter, you're using net energy metering, net energy metering aggregate, the RESBCT tariff, the feed-in tariff or remat, which is not currently available, but is expected to come back online at some point in time, and then a number of other tariffs or another of other opportunities all the way down to the community choice aggregators. Rather than go through all of these particular options, I'm going to focus in on three in particular, which are the most commonly used and most financially beneficial for these smaller type projects. So um, net energy metering is effectively using your generation at that site to offset power at load at that particular site where it's being generated, hence net energy metering. You typically get higher rates based on the type of tariff that are actually at that site. There's not gonna be any standby charges. Um, you have to retain the renewable energy credits and there's no specific, specified length of the term. The net energy metering tariff tends to be the most profitable type of tariff that's available. You'll also get um, specific incentives in California like the self-generated incentive program or SCHIP. Um, an offshoot of this type of tariff is called net energy metering aggregate. And I'm gonna hold this particular tariff because this specific type of tariff was actually used in one of our case studies in the Amador Water Agency uh, Tanner project. And when we talk to that project later on, I'll get into more specifics to it. The other specific tariff that I wanted to go over now is RESBCT. So the RESBCT tariff, or its acronym is known as the Renewable Energy Self-Generation Bill Credit Transfer Tariff, is really what you'd think about as virtual net metering. So that the way what happens at this particular tariff is if you're in a remote project where there's no on-site load that you can actually offset at the point of the, the, the um, <clears throat> turbine or the generation is you would use this concept of virtual net metering or RSBCT. So if you're at a remote site, you generate and then that generation is turned into bill credits and those bill credits can be used up to, to offset costs of up to 50 accounts for a particular client. So in this particular example, um, one of the drawbacks happens to be is you only get credits generated at the energy rate, not at the full rate or full cost of that particular site. So tariffs are broken down into, uh, in a very simplistic view, down into demand and um, energy components. You're only getting bill credits generated at the, um, the energy component for this particular uh, tariff. So this tariff also allows you to retain the RECs and there's no specific term associated with it. So like I said, the way to think about this is there's a number of different ways to monetize the power for these particular types of projects, but we see the most commonly used for these projects of this size is net energy metering and RSBCT. From a project cost perspective, um, we wanted to include, we, we looked at a number of, while we went into detail with eight case studies, we looked at data for a number of different sites that we had cost data on. And what this site shows you is, you know, from a cost perspective, um, costs from a, cost from a, um, as you would imagine, costs from a dollar per KW project go up much higher as they are smaller projects versus larger projects. Um, so what this graph is, is showing you is, if you look at the lighter blue, those are projects that are less than 100 kilowatts, so they tend to skew higher in terms of dollar per kW versus projects in the gray, which range from 100 kW to one megawatt, and the projects in dark blue ranging from one megawatt to five megawatts. So as you can see, it slopes from left to right down as a dollar per kW um, cost, as you would imagine. And some of the lead variables that are really leading that or driving that is the non-construction costs tend to be more fixed in nature than the um, construction costs. So you can think about smaller projects. If you've got a smaller size turbine, you've got smaller piping infrastructure, you've got a smaller powerhouse, less concrete. As you move towards the larger projects, obviously all of that footprint increases. 
on the non-construction side, what you're looking at is a lot of the permitting, um, environmental, engineering is very, fairly static in nature. So those costs are relatively the same for the smaller projects as they are for the larger projects. Hence, when you have the larger projects, you get a obviously more bang for your buck on the non-construction side, and you don't see a lot of your construction costs going higher. So in, as a general rule, your projects tend to be more profitable, obviously, as they get larger. So I mentioned earlier that we talked about, or we, we actually went into detail about um, eight, uh, eight specific case studies. This particular slide gives you an overview of those eight case studies, their project costs, and some of their financial metrics, more specifically the payback periods. As I mentioned earlier, typically when we have a project with 15 years or less uh, payback period, it is viewed as successful and moves forward. We've seen projects as high as 20 year payback actually move forward as well. Um, for this particular grid, the smallest size project here is a 74 kW project, the B24 project, which is coming in around $1.2 million versus the Mojave Water Agency project, which is closer to a megawatt. And that project cost comes in closer to $4.7 million in project cost. Most of these projects received um, grant money or the California Self-Generation Incentive Program. Um, at the time of the project's um, application period, they were receiving about $1.25 a KW based on the nameplate rating. That, that um, particular grant or incentive is closer to 60 cents now. So that has decreased dramatically from that point in time. When looking at design considerations for these projects, you know, the number one thing that we, we, have, to, we have to make sure we do is we don't interrupt the operations of the water facilities. So, you know, water agencies, their prime mandate is not to generate power. Their prime mandate is to provide waters for irrigation, for treatment, for things of that nature. So the last thing they really, you know, want us to do is come in and mess up their operations. So the number one thing that we always do is put our projects into a bypass installation or a bypass um, loop because we don't want to interfere with their main operations, which is to deliver water or to treat water for that matter. Um, the other things we'll look at is, is there sufficient space for a powerhouse or construction of the project? Um, you know, the projects really have to go in tandem and hand in hand with the operations, which means that they have to be put in a control system that works integrated with that particular facility. And they have to measure or excuse me, operate in terms of water pressure and flow in, in terms of what the existing facility is to do today. When, uh, you know, I mentioned that our number one concern was putting or implementing our projects in terms of a bypass loop. So what this slide shows you is a typical type of installation. And if you'll look at the top, so you've got four to 20 CFS or 120 to 150 uh, 50 PSI being broken coming into a water treatment facility. And so the existing infrastructure is, is represented in the top line, but what was built out for the hydro project was the lower three lines. And, and really what I wanna focus your attention is on the bottom two lines. Because in this particular project, there was two pumpus turbines that were implemented. And one, one of the turbines operates at a low flow. The second turbine operates at the mid flow criteria and both turbines operate at the highest flow criteria. But both the, both of the turbines were implemented in a manner where they were not operating in the main operations of the particular water facility. Effectively, they work in bypass. And that is to ensure that if anything ever happens to these particular turbines, then the water treatment facility can go back to operations as usable, usual as they did before the two turbines were actually implemented. So the final thought that we look at when implementing projects is the how they operate and perform over time. So most of our projects are required to put in some form of third party third party monitoring as part of the SGIP incentive requirements, but we like to implement um, operation and performance controls throughout the project and all of our projects. Um, some of the things that we do in this particular case is what you're seeing here is 
a monitoring system that we put in through also energy that allows us to monitor the project in a third party platform over the web. And we'll see things like pressure flow, as well as lifetime productions, some of the green attributes that are um, provided as well, like trees, carbon, gas, and methane that we're offsetting by KPIs effectively that we're, we're offsetting through this particular project. More importantly, you can put in a lot of different um, warning signals or operational um, uh, red alerts that can be passed to you through this system too, as well as what happens with the system. So if the system were to go offline, if something was noticed that flowed, flow or pressure dropped dramatically or the system tripped for some other reason, you can have alerts sent to you. So it's a very valuable mechanism put in with your project that allows um, uh, the project to move forward. So we're about to move forward in we're about to move forward and talk about the specific two specific case studies that we um, detailed in this particular project. Um, and for this particular project, uh, we went with the San Gabriel Valley Water Company as well as Amador Water Agency. Um, what you'll see is for these case studies, we, we, we actually got a pretty good distribution throughout California, ranging all the way up through uh, Northern California to Los Angeles as well as San Diego. The two projects that we're highlighting right now are San Gabriel Water Company, um, which is more in the Southern California aspect near Los Angeles, as well as Amador Water Agency, which is up north. So with this, I'm going to turn it over to Oscar Ramos, who's going to go over the San Gabriel Valley Water Company project. Good afternoon, folks. Um, I will be presenting on the two projects, the B24 and the Sand Hill um, Hydro project. And I'll start by giving you a perspective and introduction of uh, our operations and um, the service area. So for our Los Angeles division, uh, we service an area of about 45 square miles, typically around 47,000 service connections, 100% um, groundwater. We do have some interconnections with us, uh, MET, uh, but currently it's 100% supplied by groundwater uh, with 35 groundwater wells within two basins. Uh, and we have 10 entry points to the system. Within those 10 entry points to the system, we do have seven groundwater treatment facilities. And of those treatment facilities, we have a few that are um, part of the EPA uh, Superfund sites. Uh, Baldwin Park Operable Unit, South Amani Operable Unit. So they're typically uh, with uh, tangible with the uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne. In the Fontana Division, it's we serve 52 square miles of 49,000 service connections, and our service area here is supplied by both groundwater and surface water. Groundwater portion is served by 29 wells, four different basins. Uh, the four groundwater treatment we have four groundwater treatment plants and uh, we have the one surface water treatment plant that's connected to the hydro plant the um, local surface uh, supplies uh, are from a local uh, creek and also some portion of this is also from the state water project um, and i'll move to the next slide and again, before I move on to the next slide, just to let you guys know we are regulated by the California Utilities Commission. And this just this slide shows the two different service areas. Um, I won't go into detail into what service areas we have, but Los Angeles Division, we serve 16 different cities. Now, some of them all 100% of the city, some of them just a portion, and a small portion of the unincorporated area of Los Angeles County. Fontana Division, we service the entire city of Fontana and a small portion of uh, Rialto, city of Rialto. Uh, I'll start off with the Sand Hill uh, Hydro Project. Uh, we'll give you a quick perspective of the design and what we have implemented is uh, it's the, the, the head is about 18. 1800 GPM, I'm sorry, yeah, 1800 GPM to 5000 or 6000 GPMs. Uh, it is uh, equipped with a pump as turbine, uh, rating uh, 310 kW. The annual generation is about just shy of uh, 2 million kWh. Project cost was about 2 million, 
um, and as Gene had mentioned, there was some grant funding, uh, subsidies about 800K, and the payback period is eight years. And we did commission this uh, facility back in uh, 2013, and it took about a year for construction and some of the permitting processes, and it's about 12 months to for full implementation. And Sand Hill Water Treatment Plant becomes a net zero energy consumer. So the operation of this facility offsets the entire power production of that facility. I'll move on to B24. This site for San Gabriel uh, Valley Water Company is located in the Los Angeles division. It is not in operation, but currently under construction. Uh, the, the flow for this site is anywhere from 1,300 to 4,000 GPM, with the constant flow rate from a supply that will be de-energizing and producing energy is, is at a constant 3,000 GPM. Also, technology is pumped as turbine, uh, the rating is 72 kW. Annual generation will be about 400 kWh, 400,000 kWh. Project costs about $1.2 million with subsidies at $560,000 and a payback period at 10 years. Uh, as I mentioned, the status is under construction. Construction did commence in um, February of this year. Um, there was a C California Energy Commission EPIC grant recipient of this project and the plug and play civil, mechanical, and electrical design all by uh, inline energy. Current statuses of this uh, these two projects, uh, B24, Starbing Commissioning. Commissioning is scheduled for this year of uh, June 2019. The electric, power, uh, electric provider for this project is Southern California Edison. The hydro power offsets on-site booster stations. And um, at this station, we do have six boosters, uh, 150 horsepower each. And we have uh, on-site, we have a, a total of 3 million gallons of storage. And uh, there's a net investment from San Gabriel at $500,000 to complete the project. Um, currently, this site, before uh, during a design implementation, we do a lot of manual, a lot of manual um, flow operations on a PR valve. The future implementation of this project will be automated to maximize the energy production. Um, and the design, the design life for this project is 30 to 50 years. There were some hurdles during this project that we had to uh, move some pipelines over to. Uh, to begin construction of the 20 by 20 uh, footprint requirement for the turbine unit. But other than that, it was a pretty easily designed, um, very to little uh, complexities throughout the uh, design and construction. So now moving on to the Sand Hill Hydro project. Uh, it's been, like I mentioned, it's been operating since uh, November 2013. Generates clean renewable energy. Electric providers also Southern California Edison and the current uh, operation exceeds Sand Hill's usage. Power savings is over 300,000 since startup. The excess power is, export, is exported to the grid, uh, but as you know, we're not uh, power producers, so the tariff that is applicable to any excess energy, it exceed, it's, it's above 50% of the current tariff from Edison. And uh, there's Produce about six, about 700,000 kWh's of year a year since the project started uh, in excess. And as you guys know, we did imp we, we did go through a drought um, in 2014, one of the biggest droughts in 2014. And even in that year, between the state water project and local surface uh, uh, supplies, we still had about uh, 488,000 kWh's produced and. Uh, there was a, an excess of 145,000. So just to reiterate what Gene was saying, this the, during the design, this project, even through the design years, was able to accomplish and exceed the expected operation of the facility to even pay back during those years. So the design was very robust and very easily all, um, able to operate. Um, and the net investment was $1.2 million. And, um, what um, the, the operation is expected with zero electric 
of usage. And I'm just trying to, trying to close out this presentation with uh, three key elements for both projects. And um, one is being it does not impede the water operations. We have not seen any issues with uh, the implementation process with our current uh, POC programming or added maintenance o and to our operators. Very easily, very robust. It's a very efficient power generation. And then number three would be, it's a very simple design, not complex to operate and easily integrated with uh, all of our uh, current uh, programming. And uh, you guys can get into some more, some more uh, details in the uh, case study that was provided by Stantec. And with that, I will turn it over to Amador Water Agency. Great, thank you, Oscar, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, Amador County is located between Lake Tahoe and, and San Francisco, approximately about a, an hour southeast of, of Sacramento. Uh, this is a rural county with just over about 600 square miles, a population of just a little bit under 40,000. Our elevations range anywhere from about 200 feet to, to over 9,000 feet. Elevations in our service area range from about 200 feet to 4,000 feet. And we serve just under 10,000 customers. About 98% of our water supplies comes from, um, from surface water sources. Inline Energy was selected to evaluate potential in conduit hydroelectric sites for our system. Um, the site that we thought would be the best by staff, a high head um, a pipeline, ended up not to be the best option. Um, it was actually a lower head, high flow facility, the Tanner site, which we'll show more details and is highlighted here. Um, and uh, as it turned out, though, our number two site, which is, is actually also in construction, uh, which is the, the higher head uh, facility. Um, <clears throat> the Water Agency Board of Directors was, was concerned about revenues at that time on, on really the, the cost of operations and on the heels of a recession. And the hydroelectric project really provided an opportunity to help reduce some of the, the operational cost. This drawing depicts our largest water system, which delivers water to all five cities in Amateur County. Historically, the, the system received water through about a 24-mile historic mining ditch, which was replaced in 2007 by a 9-mile, 30-inch pipeline. Um, and the ditch itself lost up to about 50% of the water over its 24-mile trip to the Tanner Complex, in the middle, which is kind of designated in the middle of, of that oval circle. This new pipeline that was completed in 2007 provided an opportunity for an in-conduit hydroelectric facility. Here's a photo of the transmission pipeline. As you can see, one of the, the hilly terrain that had to be overcome with a lot of the pipeline construction. And in the upper left-hand corner, kind of the finished in-pipeline where it uh, was delivered to the Tanner um, uh, complex area. This is an overview of, of the, the Tanner complex. Um, a, a, a raw water reservoir is located in the center. To the left of the reservoir is the water treatment plant. To the right, the administration building. At the bottom is a maintenance building. And at the top is a covered treated water reservoir with a distribution pump station. The arrow designates the location of, of the hydroelectric facility. There are four PG&E electric meters on this property. The net metering aggregate tariff allows us to produce the power behind one of those meters and then apply it, uh, the, the power generated to all four accounts. We are also eligible for a self-generating incentive program that provided about $134,000, um, which, which allowed for really for a cash positive project at startup. Um, in this particular case, the water being delivered to the site needed to go directly to the treatment plant, and uh, it, it could not interrupt those facilities. We also simultaneously can divert water to the raw water reservoir which goes into a pipeline and is to serve an, another treatment plant down um, slope from this location. A 
over the this this depicts really kind of the timeline of the project. Beginning in January of 2013, we started doing a feasibility assessment, going through our initial design, getting CEQA review, with the NOI approval by FERC, filing the, the PG&E interconnection, which is actually a, a very low cost. There's only about $2,500 in costs associated with the interconnection. Start of construction in 2015, and by the summer of 2016, we were uh, had been commissioned and in operation. From here, I'm going to turn this over to Gene Goodenough to go into some more details. Thanks, Gene. Um, so this slide, really, we just wanted to demonstrate that over the over the period of time, once you start the analysis of a project, things change. As you get more data, as you get into detailed design project costs change, revenues change, things of that nature. Um, so just want to give you a sense here. In early design phases, we were thinking this project would be about 1.4 million. Uh, once we started getting interconnection costs in, we raised it. But by the end of the project, we ended up somewhere around 1.5 million in terms of the project. So, um, and if you look at the payback, um, energy rates went over over time, we generated more electricity, so revenue went up. So we originally thought the project would come in around a 19 year payback, but it looks like it's somewhere around a 13 to 14 year payback. Um, this next slide really just shows, you know, a sense of what the energy looked like at the site, the on-site load before the project and then post commissioning. So all of the bars that you're looking at in the red box is the kilowatt hour demand at that particular site. Once you implement the hydro, obviously um, the demand drops off dramatically on a daily basis, hence where your savings come in. Um, and then finally, you know, when we look at these projects and you look at how you optimize power, um, this shows the total generation for this particular project over time. One of the things that you want to think about is if there's anything you can do from an operational standpoint to um, level out your flows so you don't have higher variability in your flows or pressure, you'll, it'll allow for more um, optimized generation, which has a greater effect on your demand or your load at that particular site. So with that, I believe I'm going to turn it over to um, IU at this particular point. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Jean. Uh, so the last thing, oh, not the last thing, the second last thing from our agenda is to give an overview of the business case assessment tool that we developed in this project. Uh, as part of this project, we developed a tool to assist water and wastewater utilities and other water purveyors in the assessment of technical and economic feasibility of installing an in-conduit hydropower system in selected site of their service area. Uh, the Excel-based workbook includes functionalities for evaluating the hydropower potential at a specific site and under specific conditions, uh, the suitable in-conduit hydropower technologies uh, for the project, the related life cycle capital and O&M costs, as well as the environmental impact in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. The workbook is divided into several worksheets, which will be explained in the next slide. The first worksheet page uh, takes general information regarding the in-conduit hydropower project, site location, and the site characteristics. For the site characteristics, users can select from these drop-down menus um, in the yellow boxes to pick the options that best describe their sites. Um, the next worksheet is used to select the appropriate turbine and calculate the hydropower potential. So first, users are asked to specify the downstream pressure requirement, which will dictate the type of turbine category, whether it is reaction or impulse turbine. Users then can also select the specific turbine type from the drop-down menu. For example, here I pick compass turbine, which is part of the reaction turbine. Uh, users are also asked to complete information about the shed, flow, capacity factor, and overall efficiency. We, are, we also provide reference values uh, to help users here. Users also have the flexibility to report the values in different units. Um, all of this uh, information that the user provides will then use to automatically calculate the hydropower potential as well as the annual energy generation on the bottom of the sheet. Uh, the next slide is the worksheet for users to input assumption for the L50 analysis. We also provide reference values on the right side of the uh, on the right side of the worksheet to help users. If users know about the electricity rates for purchasing and selling, they can also input the rates on the bottom of the sheet here. 
Uh, the next slide is the worksheet to calculate the capital cost. You also provide reference values on the right side based on the turbine type and the potential uh, that the user specified before. Uh, similarly, we also provide a worksheet to estimate the O&M cost and we also provide the reference value. Uh, the next slide provides opportunity for the users to specify any grant that they may receive. For example, here I give an uh, example of putting FGIP there. Uh, we also provide a calculation for the benefits for the first year based on the energy use. Uh, the next slide uh, is used to estimate the uh, greenhouse gas emissions based on the energy generated as well as the GHG emission factor. We provide the reference value for the GHG emission uh, factor based on the plant location that the user specified. And finally, the output worksheet summarizes all the information that the users provided in their previous worksheets. Importantly, the worksheet provides the results from the LCC analysis of capital costs, OM costs, as well as the payback period and LCOE. Uh, the, last one, the last thing in our agenda is the assessment of incoming tidal power potential in California. Uh, as Carla mentioned previously in the earlier slide, in 2006, DC, along with Navigant Consulting, estimated about 255 megawatt of potential in country tidal power in California. However, it has been more than 10 years since the last assessment. Uh, with the recent regulatory changes and technological advancements, there is a need to update the recent assessment in California. Um, there are three major steps that we took to do the assessment. First, we identified the different data sources. I will explain the different data sources in the next slide. We also pre-process the data so that they will be ready for the estimation using Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, there are two types of data sources that we collected, data from installed systems and data that will be used to calculate the potential capacity from three different water agencies, namely USGS, DWR, and FWRCB. Uh, the number one issue that we face during the estimation is the fact that the data sources report different variables. As you can see, the data from the water agencies only report um, full values. Therefore, in order to calculate the capacity, we need head and capacity factor. This, we use the data from the install system to estimate for the head and capacity factor. Uh, for example, we use the common data from the install systems and the data from the water agencies to calculate the head values, and we combine them with the values obtained from the inline energy. Uh, similarly, we also uh, use the same method to estimate the capacity factor and obtain the normal distribution of the capacity factors. Um, now that we already estimate the head and capacity factor, we can use the data along with the flow data from the water agencies to calculate the capacity using this formula and input this into Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, based on the USGS data, we estimated about 368 megawatt of potential with the majority of capacity lies in the urban flows rather than the irrigation flows. We also mapped the capacity uh, using RGIS, which can be uh, accessed via the link in this page. Um, we also mapped the capacity from the install systems and compared them with the um, capacity estimated from the DWR and SWRCB. As you can see from the last uh, figure, the locations of installed systems are mostly concentrated in Southern California. Uh, but from the DWR and SWR assessments, the uninstalled capacities are still concentrated in the same area. Um, however, we also noticed that there are significant untapped capacities in the Bay Area as well. So in conclusion, there is at least 343 megawatts of installed conduit hydropower, but there is still a potential for further installation up to 404 uh, megawatts across uh, 450 locations in California. So we're running out of time here, so I'm just going to quickly summarize the presentation. Um, so in summary, the technological renaissance as well as the simplification of regulatory and permitting process provides a more favorable ground for incumbent projects, but uh, utilities should also still look at um, uh, the project costs, revenues, and grants and incentives, as well as interconnection costs, and then the impact of independent hydro system to the uh, existing system. Um, in order to have a successful implementation. Also, in regards to the uh, untapped potential, while a number of water utilities in California have already implemented in conduit hydropower systems, there is still a large in conduit hydropower potential in the water supply systems as of now. Um, some of the uh, things that uh, important for the future research needs. in conduit hydropower should be rebranded to promote future implementation. Mandate should be, um, mandates to simplify interconnection process should be, uh, are needed. And also the potential for harnessing 
hydrokinetic energy should be uh, explored further. And with that, uh, the, we conclude the um, presentation and we will take any questions. Thank you, Ayu. I think we have time for uh, just a few questions. Uh, please be advised that if we don't get your question today, we will get back to you individually by email. Uh, the first question is for Carla. Can you confirm that the 250K for Interconnect is only related to the paperwork process and does not involve any construction or design? Uh, sure. So, um, actually, the 250000 dollars for that particular project uh, includes everything, so including the paperwork as well as the infrastructure that was needed to, uh, for the interconnection process. And it, for that, uh, utility was quite high because uh, there was some work that needs to be done for uh, um, to upgrade the Southern California heritage side of, uh, of the grid. So uh, there was the need of installing a new pole with upgraded reclosers and uh, things like that. So uh, it was a comprehensive cost for, for a number of us. Okay. Uh, next question is for IU. Uh, what value was assumed for the capacity factor in the dollars per kilowatt hour calculation? Um, if you're referring to the figure that we provided in the presentation, um, so though that figure comes from the Mline Energy's on-site survey from 140 locations in California. Um, so the capacity factors vary, but the average is about 50 to 60 percent. Okay. Most of these appear to be non-portable applications. Are they also okay in a portable system? Uh, yes, actually, uh, if you look at the B24 project, that's actually for portable uh, water. Great. Uh, the next question is for Gene Goodenough. Uh, is the SGIP incentive based on how much power produced or power consumed on site? Uh, the question is, for example, if I install a 200 kilowatt turbine but no consumption on site, would I still receive SGIP? Yeah, so the, the SGIP incentive is made up of two components. Half the incentive is paid out based on the nameplate rating of the particular site. So, um, so the 200, if you had a 200 kilowatt nameplate rating and you installed a 200 kilowatt project, 50% of your incentive would be paid out on that. And then 50% is paid out over five years based on the performance of that particular turbine. So you have to produce energy per year based on what you said you would to actually get the performance payment. So there's a 50-50 split on that incentive. Okay. Uh, the next question is for Oscar. At Sand Hill, what is the hydraulic profile that makes the hydropower project cost effective? Well, the, uh, the supply can range anywhere from 120 to 150 people. And we can drop it down to drop down to five to ten psi, and the power produced at the facility versus the generation power there at the site is very uh, welcoming to the project. And I can provide you with some actual hydraulic grading models and Oregon Health Authority. Okay, uh, we've got a couple of last questions. Uh, Will the final report include possible grant or funding opportunities? I think this question is for Sylvia. Sure. The Energy Commission shows all the available grant opportunities in the CEC website, so you can go to the link that was included in the presentation, or you can go also to www.energy.ca.gov, and you can find all the funding opportunities. And the final report will be included only the technical uh, information of this project and could be really okay. I, I think we can expect release the final report by September October this year okay that was going to be my next question great uh, I think we're almost out of time here um, I would like to take a quick minute to thank the presenters for taking the time to walk us through this project I would also like to thank all of you for tuning in if you have any questions feel free to reach out to me directly uh, by my email Again, the questions we didn't have time for today, we will definitely get back to you individually by email. Uh, I would like to remind you that the slides and recording will be available for download on our website shortly. Uh, also, please take a moment to answer the survey questions in the end to help improve our future webcasts. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your day, and we'll see you all very soon on the next one. Thank you.